Ritual Crime First, we are going to look at the definition of ritual. Ritual is a set of fixed actions and sometimes words performed regularly, especially as part of a ceremony. Some daily examples of this are washing your face and brushing your teeth before bed, skincare routines and maybe a cigarette and coffee in the morning. Now we are going to look at the sociological definition. The sociological definition is that ritual is a full mode of behaviour in which the members of a group or community regularly engage. Religion represents one of the main contexts in which rituals are practiced, but the scope of ritual behaviour extends well beyond religion. Some religious examples could be praying before a meal, taking communion or fasting for Ramadan. However, rituals are not always so innocent. Ritual crimes have made appearance throughout human history, from the Aztec human sacrifices to Fiji, where widows were strangled to death by their brothers in order to be buried with their husbands, to modern-day Muti murders in South Africa. We are going to look at a case study of ritual crimes, in this case, ritual murder. We are looking at the ritualistic spree killings of the Manson family, starting by looking at the life of Charles Manson, the leader of the family. Charles Manson, originally Charles Maddox, was born 12th November 1934 to an unmarried 16 year old. He never knew his father who was a con artist who fled when he discovered the pregnancy. His early childhood consisted of his mother being in and out of jail and Manson being moved between relatives, playing truant and as time went on committing theft. After his mother was released from jail, Manson was placed in a Catholic reform school. He ran away from the school several times and after committing several robberies, was sentenced to serve time in a juvenile facility. He escaped soon after this. The next few years of his life continued in a similar fashion. Manson would be convicted for a crime, go to a juvenile facility or reform school, then escape and commit another crime. As he grew older, he married and had a son, then ended up in prison and was divorced upon his release. This then repeated, by the time he was finally released it was 1967 and Manson had spent over half his life in prison and other institutions. Once released from prison, Manson moved to San Francisco and established himself as a guru. He gained many followers, mostly middle class young women. They were dubbed the Manson family. Manson taught his followers they were the reincarnation of the original Christians and that the establishment were the Romans. This was when he began to refer to himself as Charles Willis Manson, implying that his will was the will of the Son of Man and that he was Christ. By August 1968, the Manson family had moved into a ranch in Los Angeles, which was paid for through the Manson women sleeping with its elderly owner. They also established a second base in Death Valley. It was soon after this that Manson was played the Beatles' White Album by an acquaintance. This was a very important point for Manson. He became obsessed with the albums and Beatles music in general. He was convinced the Beatles were sending him messages in their songs. These messages also aligned with Manson's own beliefs. For a while Manson had been preaching to the family that a race war between white people and black people, from here on referred to as African Americans, was approaching and soon African Americans would rise up all over the cities of America. On New Year's Eve, Manson gathered his followers together and explained that the social turmoil he'd been telling them about was also predicted by the Beatles and their white album was directed at the Manson family. He said the Beatles were giving them a task to protect the worthy from the impending war. In January 1969, the family moved from the desert to a yellow house close to their ranch. Manson gave the house the code name Yellow Submarine. In the house, the family prepared for the upcoming apocalypse, which Manson turned Helter Skelter, another Beatles reference. By February, Manson had a plan. The family were going to make an album like the Beatles and this album would spark the race war. 
While the war was on, the family would live in a city underground in Death Valley. Once the African Americans won the war and killed all the whites, the family would come out of hiding and rule over the African Americans. By June 1969, Manson had begun to say they may have to show the African Americans how to start Helkata Scouter. He ordered one of the family members, Watson, to obtain some money to help the family prepare for the conflict. Watson did this by defrauding an African American drug dealer named Crow. Crow then threatened to kill everyone in the Manson Ranch. Manson responded to this by shooting Crow on July the 1st. Manson later heard a news report that a Black Panther member had been found dead. He was convinced it was Crow and that the Panthers would soon retaliate. He turned the ranch into a defensive camp with armed guards. Members of the family believed that this proved how to Scouter was approaching as African Americans were trying to get at the Chosen Ones. The next victim of the Manson family was Gary Hinman. He befriended members of the Manson family in the past. Manson believed Hinman was wealthy and sent family members Bo Sum Lee, Berner and Atkins to Hinman's home on July 25th to persuade him to join the family and turn over any money he had. Hinman refused to join, so the three members held him hostage for two days. Manson turned up at some point to slash Hinman's ear with a sword. After this, Bo Sam Lee stabbed Hinman to death as per the instructions Manson left. Before leaving the house, one of the three members used Hinman's blood to write Political Piggy and draw a Black Panther paw on the wall. Piggy being a reference to a Beatles song and the Black Panther paw in order to implicate them in the murder and help spark the war. This would become a common practice in their future murders. Bosom Lee was arrested August 6, 1969 after he had been caught driving Hinman's car. Police found the murder weapon in the car. Two days later, Manson told family members at the ranch, now is the time for Helter Skelter. The next day, 8th of August, Manson directed Watson to take the three fam- female members, Atkins, Caspian and Crenwinkle, and to go to a house on Ceylon Drive, a past home of Terry Munchen, a music producer associate with Manson. Manson directed the members of the family to kill everyone in the house and for the women to do as Watson said. The property had been recently rented to a celebrity couple, Sharon Tate and director Roman Pransky, who was shooting a film in Europe at the time. The group of four killed five people in the house, actress Sharon Tate, who was eight months pregnant at the time, her unborn child was also killed, Jay Sembrug, Abigail Fulger, and Wojciech Forkowski and Stephen Parent. This was the first group of deaths that featured overkill. One example of this is Sharon Tate's cause of death. Tate was stabbed 16 times, but at least four of the wounds were individually fatal. Frogan was stabbed 28 times, and Forkowski 51 times. After the killings, Atkins used the blood to write pig, another recurring factor in the Manson family murders. These murders created a national scandal, but Manson was not happy. Some of the victims from the Tate murders had escaped the house while the group was there and ended up dying in the garden. Manson felt the murder was too messy and wasn't carried out how he had instructed. So the next night, Manson and the four involved in the Tate murders and two more members of the Manson family, Van Houten and Grogan, drove to a house. Manson came with them in order to show them how it's done, to make sure there wasn't a repeat of the Tate house. They travelled to the home of supermarket executive Leon Labianca and his wife Rosemary, a dress shop home. Manson walked up the driveway and entered the house alone. He returned later to tell the group that the couple had been tied up in the house. The couple also had pillowcases over their heads secured by lamp cords. Watson Van Houten and Kerwinkel entered the Labianca house while Manson took the two others to another house, hoping for a double murder. He left them at a apartment block to carry out the killing. 
However, they knocked on the wrong door, waking a stranger and had to abandon the plan and flee. Back at the Labrienka house, the women went into the bedroom to deal with Mrs Labrienka, while Watson began stabbing the husband with a bayonet. Apparently Manson had given him this after Watson complained about the weapons they'd used at the Tate house being inadequate. His first rest went into the man's throat. He then left the victim to investigate the sounds of the scuffle in the bedroom. He found Mrs Labrienka fending off the two women with the lamp still attached to the cord round her neck, violently swinging it at them blindly. Watson subdued her with several stabs from the bayonet and then returned to his original victim, who he stabbed a total of 12 times, then carved the word war into the man's exposed stomach. Returning to the bedroom, he found Korinsky repeatedly stabbing Mrs. B- La- Bianca with a knife from the victim's kitchen. Remembering Manson's instructions that both women had to play a part in the murders, he told Van Houten to stab the woman. She did 16 times. Lo, mis- Lo Mrs. La Bianca was already dead at this point. It was later found that many of the victims' 41 stab wounds were inflicted post-mortem, another example of overkill. Mr. La Bianca's body was also brutalised after his death. Kerwinkle gave the gentleman 14 puncture wounds with her ivory-handled two-timed carving fork, which he left, she left jutting out of his stomach. She also planted a state knife in his throat. Before doing this, she wrote, Rise, death to pigs, and held a skelter around the house in blood. They then cleaned their weapons, showered, and then hitchhiked home. After these murders, the Manson family went quiet as their ranch was raided and Manson and 25 others were arrested by the police on August the 12th as suspects in a major auto theft ring. However, they were soon released as the warrant had been misdated and there was therefore void. The murderers were finally apprehended after Atkins confessed her and the family's involvement in the murders and evidence such as the killer's guns, knives and bloody clothes were found. Manson was already in custody on another charge and the others were arrested after a warrant was put out on them on December the 1st, 1969. The trial began on the 15th of June 1970 and was simply bizarre. Manson tried to and was stopped from serving as his own attorney after breaking several gag orders. On Friday the 24th of July, the first day of testimony, Manson appeared in court with an X carved into his forehead. He issued a statement that he was considered inadequate and incompetent to speak or defend himself and that he'd exed himself from the establishment's world. Over the following weekend, the female defendants duplicated this mark on their own forehead, as did many of the family members within the day or so. Along with all this madness, the Manson family, after being banned from the courthouse, held vigil outside, opening, carrying, hunting knives and threatening witnesses about to testify. Manson also tried to attack the judge and had to be removed from the courthouse. The defence attorney also disappeared after a weekend hunting trip. The whole case was sensationalised by the media, and rightly so. Also, the women being tried, along with Manson, repeatedly attempted to defend him and swear that he had nothing to do with the murders. The judge did not believe their claims, believing Manson had told them to say this in order to save himself. The prosecution argued the triggering of Helter Skelter was Manson's main murder. The crime scene's bloody white album references, Pig, Rise, Helter Skelter, matched with the testimony about Manson's predictions of the uh, murders African Americans would commit on the onset of Helter Skelter. He said it would involve the writing of pigs on the wall with the victim's blood. Finally, Manson and the others were found guilty on the 19th of April 1971 and sentenced to death, though this was later changed to life in prison as the state removed the death penalty. Despite being found guilty, for years members of the family still followed Manson, even moving closer to his jail. There were many more murders connected to the family over the years, including an attempted assassination of a president. Charles Manson died of a heart attack and complications from colon cancer on November the 19th, 2017. He was 83 years old. Many books, films and documentaries have been created by multiple parties about the Manson family over the years. There's one coming out uh, in 2019, I believe, in the spring as well. 
So, what makes these ritual murders instead of just murders? The difference between murder and ritual murders is that the ritualistic killing goes beyond what's necessary just to kill someone. There's overkill or mutilation, and usually some kind of symbolic evidence. For example, symbols carved into the body, there could be symbols painted on the floor, it can be the position of the body, the staging of the killing. They tend to be multiple homicides too, and the timing can also indicate ritual murders, like the significance of dates or the significance of holidays specific to different ideologies. We see these in the Manson murders, the constant overkill of victims, the repeated painting of words with the victim's blood at the scene, and in the Labianca murders, the carving of war into the victim's stomach. So, despite these murders not fitting the public perception of a ritual killing, e.g. candles everywhere, a underground drawn in blood on the floor, people wearing robes and chanting, they are still ritual murders. At this point, it would make sense to talk about the theories on ritual crimes. However, most theories at this time are unsubstantiated and have no evidence that supports them. For this reason, we will not be talking about theories today. Instead, we're going to talk about the law concerning ritual crime, using the Manson family murders as an example. Although it must be taken into account, the Manson murders happened in America and we will be looking at UK law. In the UK, there are no laws specific to rituals. However, the country's general laws do govern what it is legal to do and during rituals. It is obvious that the Manson family's actions were illegal, but what kind of prison sentence would they face in the UK? Sentencing for the crime of murder varies in the UK dependent on a number of factors. For example, a person cannot be given a life sentence if they're under the age of 21. However, this example would not affect the Mansons on trial as they were all over this age. What does affect them is their actions before, during and after the crime. We know that they brought weapons with them to the murder and used them in the murder. That gets them 25 years minimum starting point. The fact they killed more than one person puts their sentence up to 30 years minimum. If we add to this that all the murders were premeditated, and were done to advance a political, religious or ideological cause, the race war, this causes their sentence to raise to whole life starting point. Although in these cases a judge can use their own judgment to set a point in which they can apply for parole. Any crime involving two or more people or a child involving a substantial degree of premeditation or planning the adoption of the victim and or sexual or sadist conduct all come with a whole life minimum sentence. This is all well and good concerning the Manson case, but I believe that the UK should have laws that are specific to ritual crime, although this would be difficult as ritual crime is a broad term. However, I still believe there is a need because of the nature of these crimes, the manipulation and or authority over others that may be involved and the extremes this can lead to. There should be something that governs and controls rituals that involve criminal activity.